Good evening, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this first session of our mini course titled An Indigenous History of the Upper Great Lakes Region with Professor Patty Lowe of Northwestern University. This is the sixth in a series of non-credit, no cost introductions to topics of interest across the disciplinary spectrum offered as a collaboration between Evanston Public Library and the Northwestern Emeriti Organization. Tonight's mini course will be continued and concluded next Tuesday, May 18th, also at 7 p.m. The Zoom link for next week's session has been sent out to everyone, whether you were originally registered or placed on the waiting list. If you are with us here this evening, that's pretty good evidence that you also have the link for next week. If not, please be in touch. Before introducing our speaker this evening, let me first express gratitude to both partners who have made this series possible. The Northwestern Emeriti Organization, about 600 strong, from whose ranks the teaching talent is recruited, and Evanston Public Library, which provides the registration infrastructure and mobilizes its impressive publicity machinery to draw attention to our course offerings. On behalf of Evanston Public Library, let me just also mention that our annual report is arriving in mailboxes across Evanston right now. The report for 2020 reflects a year like no other. Our pandemic response, the call to racial and social justice, and much, much more. This report is also available in a new dynamic online format. Just go to epl.org slash annual report 2020, no spaces. Our topic this evening will be the history of the Upper Great Lakes region from a First Peoples perspective. Even calling it the Upper Great Lakes reflects that perspective. Upper does not mean north, it means upstream. Our instructor will be Professor Patty Lowe of the Medill School of Journalism of Northwestern University, who is also director of Northwestern Center for Native American and Indigenous Research, and additionally, herself a member of the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Ojibwe. Her professional and scholarly credits are numerous. She is the author of Indian Nations of Wisconsin, Histories of Endurance and Renewal, now in its second edition. It won the Wisconsin Library Association's 2002 Outstanding Book Award. She wrote Native People of Wisconsin, also newly revised and expanded, which is used by 20,000 Wisconsin school children as a social studies text. Her latest book, Seventh Generation Earth Ethics, won the 2014 Midwest Book Award for Culture. Professor Lowe has produced many documentaries for public and commercial television, including the award-winning Way of the Warrior, which aired nationally on PBS in 2007 and 2011. For 20 years, she hosted news and public affairs programming for Wisconsin Public Television. This evening's class will be about 90 minutes long. During the lecture segment, everyone will be muted. So please put any questions or comments you have for Professor Lowe in the chat box. And she will get to as many as she can during the last 20 minutes of class. Uh, make sure that you send your comment or question to everyone. What we don't get to this evening will go into our chat log Professor Lowe will see this and add her answers and comments to it. And we will be sending uh, that annotated chat log out then to everybody on our class list. So let's get started. Thank you everyone for coming. I want to turn things over now to Professor Lowe for this evening's class. Over to you, Patty. Thank you, Miigwech. Bujou, Patty Lowe, and Dishnukaz, Mashkazibi, and Dojiba, Mung Dodem. Uh, my name is Patty Lowe. I am a citizen of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa or Ojibwe. And my 
um, clan is Loon. So I want to thank everybody for inviting me. Um, I hope you enjoy this evening. And uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen right now. Um, remembering to optimize my video and audio. And then I have to do one more thing to get rid of hide loading meeting control. Okay, so you should be able to see um, a big slide that says an indigenous history of the upper Great Lakes region. And unless Jeffrey or someone says they don't see that, I'm just going to assume that all I can see is my screen. I can't see the, anybody in Zoom right now. So if I don't hear anything, I'm just going to continue. Um, so an indigenous history of the upper Great Lakes region. But first, I want to give you some background about Native American policy, some major history, and just some realities so you have a framework for understanding who um, our native neighbors are. First thing is you have to understand sovereignty. Sovereignty is the right to self-govern. It's inherent. It's not something that the government gives or confers. Um, but the US government acknowledged the inherent right um, of the inherent sovereignty of the Indian nations it was negotiating with by treaty, the very act that it sat down and negotiated um, meant that they believed, the US believed that um, Indian nations were sovereign over their lands and had the right to cede them or be um, removed of them. Okay, so sovereignty and treaties, treaty rights. Um, treaties are promises made between two sovereigns. So treaty making is a power reserved to the United States government. It's one of those powers that the federal government embraced. States do not have the right to enter into treaties. And um, this is set down in the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution of the United States. Article 6, Clause 2 establishes that the Constitution, federal laws made pursuant to it, and treaties made under its authority constitutes the supreme law of the land and thus take prior priority over any conflicting state laws. So in other words, um, uh, when a state becomes a state, it doesn't negate the treaties that the federal government made with Indians before that state was created. And this becomes important, and we'll talk about this next week when we talk about environmental issues. Um, so how did the United States come to acquire Indian lands? Um, here's an interesting interactive map that shows um, shows how that happened and when it happened. And I want you to look at the state of uh, what becomes the state of Illinois in the 1800, early 1800s, you begin to see how the treaty lands were ceded. And there's no sound to this. Okay, so here we see the 13 original colonies and now land is being acquired by treaty. Um, and treaty making was a pretty coercive, okay, now you see early 1800s, Illinois is um, seated 1833 uh, is when our area uh, was seated in the Treaty of Chicago. Um, my reservation, uh, my my ancestral lands there in northern Wisconsin were reserved, um, ceded initially in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, and then our reservations were created in 1854. So we're almost to the end of treaty making. You see a vast portion of Oklahoma is about to disappear. That was the place that um, the government uh, had a, a quite a, uh, a major initiative, this vision of moving all the 
the native land, the native communities that were east of the Mississippi River to this, what became the state of Oklahoma. Um, and that didn't really happen uh, because Oklahoma was divided um, by something called the Allotment Act. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Okay, so again, treaties are affirm they don't confer tribal sovereignty and native nations have the sovereign power to create governments laws taxes justice systems in exchange for the land that the government acquired it obligated itself in something called the indian trust responsibility so it's a legally enforceable fiduciary obligation on the part of the united states to protect tribal treaty lands assets, resources, as well as a duty to carry out the mandates of federal law with respect to American Indian and Alaska native tribes and villages. Sometimes that didn't always happen. Um, the US government limited tribal sovereignty and this was something that was imposed unilaterally. I, I don't know of a single case in which uh, a, a native uh, nation and there are 574 of them, by the way, um ever said please take our sovereignty <laughs> but sovereignty was limited through executive orders through congressional acts and by um, judicial decisions example of those limitations um the indian removal act of 1830 this was the grand plan to move all the indians that were living east of the mississippi river to what eventually became Oklahoma, and then those lands were, were privatized and allotted as well. The General Allotment Act in 1887 privatized most Indian reservations and divided it, allotting individual parcels of land, uh, 80 acres in this part of the country, 120 acres out west where more land was needed for ranching. So though that was um, meted out to individual tribal members, and then the excess was opened up to uh, white homesteaders, either free land or uh, very low priced land per acre. Uh, the Major Crimes Act was another uh, limitation of tribal sovereignty. That was in 1885. It assumed, the federal government assumed jurisdiction for certain crimes committed by Native Americans on Native land. Public Law 280 transferred some of that jurisdiction to states that had large populations of, of Native people, including Wisconsin. Um, that happened in the 1950s. And then termination was another policy um, that again happened in the 1950s uh, where the government uh, was trying to save money and dismantle the reservation system, thought um, there were certain tribes that might have more money and would do well if they were just cut loose and the federal trust responsibility ended. Um, the Menominee and the Klamath were the two biggest tribes to be terminated and that was really disastrous for them. I mentioned the Allotment Act, um, 90 million acres lost and the land that was opened up for white homesteading was often done so in a checkerboard fashion with the hope being that Native Americans would transition from a hunting, fishing and gathering um, subsistence way of, of living to farming. And if they lived next to uh, white Protestant farmers, then they would uh, learn that ethic and and we we would solve the Indian problem. There wouldn't be wouldn't be any more Indians. They would they would be hyphenated Americans like German Americans or Polish Americans. They'd be Indian Americans instead of American Indians. So um, at the same time that, that was going on, uh, there was this um, belief that Native people needed to be saved from themselves. So. Native children, uh, and I'm always surprised, um, many people just have never learned about Indian boarding schools. And it was such a huge thing in Indian history. Between the 1870s and 1934, and sometimes beyond, but 1934 was when most of the boarding, boarding schools closed. Um, Indian children were taken and put in these industrial boarding schools based on Carlisle. That's this photo right here. Um, 
the Carlisle Indian School opened up in 1870, in the late 1870s by Colonel Richard Pratt, who was uh, had a military background and he um, loved to have Indian kids come in with long hair, pose them in pictures and then do before and after pictures, posing them in the same um, frame, um, but now with their hair cut and wearing civilized clothing. Um, but these were places where Native children went to school in the morning, learning reading, writing, and, and arithmetic. And then in the afternoons, they learned trades like how to do laundry. Um, little boys trained and learned how to be soldiers. And that um, became really important in World War I. And I'll get to that in just a second. But, um, you know, kids received half an education. Some, some rose above it. Carlos Montezuma, for example, got his medical degree at Northwestern. But as a rule, these were kids who were going to form an exploitable second class of domestic servants and farmhands. Um, and along the way, there was tremendous suppression at many of these boarding schools, native, native languages, cultural expression, spiritual practices, tribal governments, the mantra was kill the Indian and save the man. Here's a boarding school survivor that lives here in Chicago talking about the experience. Brought kids in, they were eight, nine, 10 years old, took them away from their families. This is a good way to train them not to be savage or free. We'll put them in these militaristic style enclosures, separate them from their families, take the language away, take the songs away, cut their hair, um, not allow them to do what they've been doing for thousands of years. And to a degree it worked. There are many that after going to boarding schools, and it was uh, because it was run like the military, the punishments were the same. There were beatings, whippings. Our, our school systems, if you compare them with any others in the country, are the only ones that have graveyards. No other school system has that. From young people running away in the dead of winter or whenever, and because they were so isolated and apart from their own surroundings, many died, they were brought back, and. It's still a bad memory for many of us. Uh, but again, after 300 years of it, it's become norm, our norm. Yeah, the, the boarding schools, you know, there are estimates um, that 90% of the world's indigenous languages will be extinct by the year 2045. And there are communities now that have no first speakers left because of the boarding schools. And there's this incredible anxiety in Indian country to preserve and revitalize these languages. Um, so the boarding schools um, provided, uh, it, it was a seamless transition from the boarding schools to the training camps to the front lines in World War I. Um, many, many Native American men enlisted for service during World War I, including my grandfather um, pictured here. This is Edward Denomi and um, or Denomi. <laughs> North of Highway 8 in Wisconsin, it's pronounced Denemy, and south of Highway 8 uh, in the Milwaukee area, it's, it's uh, pronounced Denomi. But he was one of 25,000 Native American who enlisted. Um, these boarding schools were very militaristic, as Robert Wapahi just told us. And children marched to the dining rooms, they marched to the dormitories, they marched to their classes. And, um, and so, you know, militarism was what they knew. And um, besides, they were able to earn money by serving in the National Guard. Um, and those National Guard units became the vanguard of the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. And so I want to show you um, an excerpt from the documentary that Jeffrey 
referenced in his introduction. It looked at the relationship between Native Americans and the US military. And a lot of people are surprised to learn that Native Americans have the highest military enlistment rate of any race in America. And so um, that continued into World War II as well. Native men were integrated into the military unlike African-American men who were segregate, served in segregated units. So I was really interested in, in exploring that. And in this excerpt, you're going to hear a poem by a Vietnam veteran, Jim, the late Jim Northrup, who um, dealt with his post-traumatic stress disorder by writing poetry. And then you'll also see a small segment. My grandfather kept a diary of his time overseas and he fought in all five major battles. Um, I'll tell you more about that, but I'll play the excerpt first. Ogichida. I was born in war, WW2. Listened as the old men told stories of getting gassed in the trenches, WW1. Saw my uncles come back from Guadalcanal, North Africa, and the Battle of the Bulge. Memorized the war stories my cousins told of Korea. Felt the fear in their voices. Finally, it was my turn, my brothers too. Joined the Marines in time for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Heard the crack of rifles in the rice paddies south of Da Nang. Saw my friends die there and tasted the bitterness of the only war America ever lost. My son is now a warrior. Will I listen to his stories or cry into his open grave? February 18th, 1918, arrived in Brest, France. Denomi's diary offers a window into the war. August 4th, 1918, got shelled on the road. Observation by a Bosch balloon. Heavy casualties under severe shell fire. High explosives and gas. Lost my friend Chubb by shrapnel. hit in a little village in France. I don't know what this, the, the village was, but he saw it hit and he saw the flash and it, it must have ricocheted. Yeah, it was interesting. Oh, I think my uh, grandfather was probably the most documented soldier in World War One. I. I have photos and this uh, incredible diary and um, I'll, I'll tell you more about that if you're interested. Um, I, I spent some time in the Wisconsin Historical Society and I was looking at uh, film military films to see if I had enough um, film from World War One in order to do this documentary and um, I kept seeing this little canister of unmarked film and I finally put it in this tiny little reader and couldn't believe it it was um, film uh, that was taken um, by the Signal Corps in June of 1916, which was the exact month that my grandfather was training at Camp Douglas in Wisconsin. And so, you know, it, and then another relative gave me um, a, some photos that uh, the film had been developed, but didn't have the positives. And he thought that you know, he saw somebody with a bugle and somebody that looked like they were wearing a doughboy. Um, and it was a collection of amazing photos of men playing at war, pointing their rifles at each other. And they had no idea that um, that this training camp, from this training camp, that they were about to just experience hell in France. Um, 
and then my grandfather's diary. So it was like he was saying, you know, he wanted to be in my documentary, <laughs> never intended <laughs> to include him uh, when I started it, but he wound up, he wound up being in my documentary. So after um, the, be, you know, between the, the two wars, um, the 1934 Indian Reorganization Act um, that came out of the Roosevelt administration ended allotment, it stopped the privatization of Indian land, it uh, recommended that boarding schools close. The next few decades were marked by poverty and isolation, lack of economic opportunities, relocation, cultural stress. And then here's another thing that very few people know, and just about every family that I know of in Native America has been touched by this. Between 1950 and 1978, adoption and foster care were rampant. Um, it created this incredible identity crisis. In Minnesota, one in four Native babies was fostered or adopted, most into white homes. So I'm going to play you an excerpt from a documentary that Vox um, did. And it's um, it, it's just, just terribly tragic. And there are a lot of people my age that are dealing with, um, you know, fear of, uh, separation, they, they have separation and, and anxiety, fear of intimacy, attachment disorders. And uh, we're dealing with a lot of generational trauma because of this. So here's uh, that excerpt. But just as the boarding school era started fading, another assimilation project took shape, adoption. <laughs> The main goal of this pilot project was to stimulate the adoption of American Indian children to primarily non-Indian adoptive homes. They claimed it was to promote the adoption of the forgotten child, but it was essentially a continuation of the boarding school assimilation tactics. And the strategy came with a financial advantage for the government too. Adoption was cheaper than running boarding schools. But first, adoption officials had to sell white America on the idea of adopting Native American children. Feature stories like this one in Good Housekeeping marketed them to white families. They were described as unwanted and adoption gave them a chance at new lives. In the end, their media campaign worked. White families wanted Indian adoption. But the problem was many of these children were not orphans that nobody wanted. They were kids often ripped apart from families that wanted to keep them. You still will hear stories today of people, you know, my age, older, saying, I remember as a child, um, the social worker was coming and people would hide their children. On reservations, social workers used catch-all phrases like child neglect or unfit parenting as evidence for removal. But their criteria was often questionable. Some accounts describe children being taken away for living with too many family members in the same household. An extended family is a big thing for Native people. And that means being judged for being in a house that's overcrowded. So it's always whiteness is the standard for success. And everything else is judged by that standard. By the 1960s, about one in four Native children were living apart from their families. The official Indian Adoption Project placed 395 Native American children into mostly white homes, but it was just one of many in an era of Native American adoptions. Other state agencies and private religious organizations began increasingly making placements for Native American children too. My mother giving me up was a white person telling her if she didn't, she would never see her other kids again. In one of the documents I have, it's addressed to my biological father, Victor Fox, that he was trying to look us up to get a hold of us. But Hennepin County wrote, Daniel and Douglas are adapting very well in their new family. This was totally, um, it was a false statement. 
when you're adopted, you know you're missing something. Um, I think I've likened it to having like when someone has like a 500 piece puzzle and they have all the pieces to make this pretty picture except one. My adoptive mother was not well verbally, physically and sexually and, and spiritually abusive. So by the, by the time I was 14, I started drinking, 15 drugs were added and I became an addict to numb. I didn't realize I was numbing pain. I tried suicide, tried slicing my wrist one time. Children were taken and believed like I believed for a long time. But there was something wrong with me versus something wrong with the system. The Indian Adoption Project was considered a success by the people who set it in motion. Officials claimed, generally speaking, we believe the Indian people have accepted the adoption of their children by Caucasian families and have been pleased to learn the protection afforded these children. But the truth was unsettling. These hearings on Indian children's welfare is now in session. Well, I was pregnant with Bobby and the welfare kept coming over there and asking me if I'd give him up for adoption. Before, you, before he was even born? Yeah. They picked up my children and placed them in a foster home. And uh, I think that they were abused in a foster home. Four years after Native people organized in this Senate hearing, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act, known as ICWA. It gives tribes a place at the table in court. States would be required to provide services to families to prevent removal of an Indian child. And in case removal was necessary, they would have to try to keep the child with extended family or another Native American family. Without our relatives, we cease to exist. So with Native people, part of our wealth is in our family. It's in who we're connected to. But the legacy of family separation in Native communities has been difficult to fully undo. Today, Native American children are four times more likely to be placed in foster care than white children, even when their families have similar presenting problems. In these cases, ICWA is often the best legal protection they have, and it's been under attack repeatedly. A young girl ripped from her foster family because of the Indian Children Welfare Act. White adoptive families intent on keeping Native American children have tried to do away with the act, and they're often backed by conservative organizations. The Indian Child Welfare Act was dealt a blow earlier this month. The subject of a lawsuit issued on Tuesday by the Goldwater Institute arguing that preferences given to American Indian families to adopt Indian children is unconstitutional and discriminates based on race. It's, it's a way for these industries, um, these very powerful industries, to try to attack what Indian identity is. Wanting to overturn ICWA is connected to everything about who we are as a nation. So if we don't have any protections for our families, and if we don't have protections for our treaties, then we have um, no more Indians. We've been under attack, we're gonna continue to be under attack. And we have to keep, just keep fighting. It's in our DNA to survive. We are nations that pre-exist European contact, and we are still here. that um, there is a confusion, you know, this federal judge in Texas uh, initially overturned ICWA saying that it discriminated on the basis of race. But again, this is a question about sovereignty, not race. And that eventually um, an appeals court uh, determined that as well. So the last couple of decades um, have brought some economic opportunities and cultural renewal to some Indian nations. Others still struggle. In the upper Great Lakes region, native communities face serious challenges because of climate change and other threats. I, I'm gonna talk more about that next week. But first, um, you've been waiting to for me to get on track and, and tell you about the indigenous people here in the upper Great Lakes region, but I think it's really important to kind of have a, a, a an understanding of some of the general truisms of, of native people.
people, including the policies that have worked um, against them over the past 500 years. So um, Indian nations of the Great Lakes region, um, they really are histories of endurance and renewal. Okay, here's a quiz for you. Um, anybody know how many federally recognized Indian nations are in Wisconsin? Illinois. Oh, what did I say? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forgive me, please. Thank, thank you very much. How many federally recognized Indian nations are in Illinois? And the answer is none. Um, we have no uh, nations. We have Native people here, lots of Native people, but no recognized Indian nations. Um, do we know what the city of Chicago means in Anishinaabe, in Alg Algonquin language? Yep, it means a place of the skunk or a skunk town. Um, and that's maybe because there were lots of skunks here. Maybe there were, it was because of the skunk cabbage that skunks eat. Um, maybe it just didn't smell very good, but that's the, that's the name my people gave, gave to it. Um, I mentioned uh, our, that we migrated the Anishinaabe, which includes the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Odawa. Uh, Odawa migrated from the east um, and our one of our oldest stories is about this migration um, the word anishinaabe which is our word for ourselves um, refers to this confederacy of three tribes but the word means from whence descended man and or humans and we believe we are indigenous to the upper Great Lakes region. We left uh, because of floods, we wound up on the East Coast and um, we were there for a very long time, um, presumably after the glaciers melted and we needed to move um, away from some of the glaciers that were melting in the Great Lakes region. And then there, there was this prophecy that said, we were going to be destroyed unless we returned to our original homes where the food grows on water. And so um, we packed up and this is the route we took. Um, we were living on the shore of the Great Salt Sea, presumably the Atlantic Ocean. Um, archeologists tell us that we were here near the Gulf of St. Lawrence and our stories tell us that there would be a shell that would appear and disappear in the, the sky in the West. And we were supposed to follow that and it would lead us to seven stopping places. Um, some of them are, um, are recognizable today, including Niagara Falls, place of thundering water, um, Detroit, where the, uh, the Detroit River cut through the landscape like a knife, Manitoulin Island, which remains a very spiritual place, um, important medicines there. Sault Ste. Marie, where the water was so shallow, you could walk across, um, you could almost walk across the water and walk, walk across the, bank, the backs of fish. The fish were so plentiful. So at the Western Great Lakes, um, the Anishinaabe split into three groups. The Potawatomi came south and settled the area um, in present day uh, southwestern Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, all the way up uh, to the Door Peninsula. The Odawa went north um, along the north edge of Lake Superior, and my folks went um, west along the south shore of what we now know as Lake Superior, Gichigami. So once we got here, and my reservation, Shawamigan Bay here, um, that's where my people are. And we have a, a, a little piece of Madeline, what's now known as Madeline Island. We call it Monawana Conning, the place of the gold rusted woodpecker, the flickers. Um, but this is where my reservation is, just head north from Chicago and keep going until you get wet. We're right on the shore of Lake Superior. So this is, um, you know, so the Anishinaabe 
arrive in the upper Great Lakes region and what did the land look like? How did people get along? Here's an interview from our indigenous tour of Northwestern with Professor John Lau, who's a Pakagan Potawatomi member and a professor at Ohio State University. It was a, uh, a place of exchange of items. It was ex a place of exchange of ideas. Uh, it was a place of exchange of um, agreements to participate, alliances. Uh, it was a place where uh, things were uh, uh, worked out together. It was a place of gathering. Uh, clans would gather here uh, an intermarriage. So Chicago was, oops. It was a- Chicago was a crossroads. And um, and then Jean-Baptiste Pont du Sable shows up. He's a trader of African, probably Haitian descent. He's the per first permanent non-indigenous re resident of what would become Chicago. This is about the 1780s. He married Kitty Waha, a Potawatomi woman, and together they operated a very successful trading post closer to home in the Evanston area. Um, there were semi-permanent Potawatomi villages where people um, would process wild rice and maple syrup. Um, there were sugar camps. Um, they uh, would uh, hunt fur-bearing animals, and all of those trade trade items would be brought to Dusabla's uh, fort um, in trade. So. 1780s, you know, this is the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, not a really important war for Native people. Um, it was for some of the Eastern tribes, the, um, the uh, what most people think of as the Iroquois Confederacy. They don't really like that term much, Iroquois. It um, is a derogatory term that my tribe gave them. Um, they like to be called the Haudenosaunee people building a longhouse. Um, so the Revolutionary War, War affected them. Um, there were some individual bands that got involved in the Revolutionary War, but not like the War of 1812. This was a really important war for us. It was devastating for Native nations. Um, the British had set up a boundary and had tried to keep colonists from coming over the Cumberland Gap and the Appalachians. Dan Daniel Boone um, led American colonists into the Ohio Valley. And um, so when, when the, the War of 1812 broke out, many Native communities, especially in the Ohio Valley, allied with the British to halt American expansionism. There were two brothers, Tecumseh and um, Tesquitana, his um, also called the, the Shawnee Prophet, who were building Pan-Indian alliances. Tecumseh was building a military alliance to stop the incursion of American colonists, while the Shawnee Prophet was preaching this sort of back to traditional religions, um, uh, avoid um, American and, and foreign trade goods, um, embrace your old religions, embrace your old ways. And together they had this vision of, of native people pushing these European and American colonists out of Indian country. During the middle of that, okay, so here's the, the some of you know about uh, Fort Dearborn, this, is one of the mat it was a minor battle in the grand scheme of the war of 1812 of course it was you know important to the people that lived here in june of 1812 the us declares war on great britain americans are they don't want to be conscripted into the british navy which is um, fighting napoleon and they need bodies and the americans don't want to have anything to do with it there are also squabbles about borders um, uh, and the United States is, is they're, they're eyeing Canada and hoping that Canada, what became Canada will, will um, be part of the United States. So um, the 
American forts are falling and uh, Fort Mackinac falls and the Americans at Fort Dearborn are very nervous and they decide to evacuate. So in August, they meet with the Potawatomi, they tell them that they're going to evacuate the fort and they're gonna turn over some guns, ammunition and provisions, but they don't do that. Instead, they destroy the goods. That makes the Potawatomi very nervous. Um, the Miami are also involved in this. They agree to um, escort the evacuees out of the fort. So at one point, the Potawatomi and nine, the 93 evacuees, which include army regulars, militia, women and children. And here's where the written reports of the survivors and the oral reports handed down from the Potawatomi are in conflict. Um, the Potawatomi describe it as acting in self-defense. The Americans say that the Potawatomi were the aggressors. Um, there's also a question about what role the Miami wind, wind up playing. The Miami, um, according to some of the written reports, sort of disengage and don't take part in fighting against the Americans. But there are some descriptions, um, written descriptions that the Miamis are fighting on the side of the Americans when everything is said and done, there are only 41 survivors. The Potawatomi have won a battle, but they've lost the war. Um, Tecumseh is killed in, uh, in a battle in 1812, in, 18, uh, in, in the war. Um, it's a couple of years after the war begins. The British sign the Treaty of Ghent and don't include any native representatives um, they did try to establish a native sovereignty zone, but the Americans wouldn't, wouldn't hear, hear of it. And so the British wind up basically uh, signing over pretty much everything except Canada. They were able to hold on to Canada, but they pretty much, you know, um, sign, sign everything over to the Americans. And um, the native allies are left out in the cold. And this is the pretext by which the American government begins forcing Indian removals. Um, Tecumseh's Pan-Indian Alliance crumbles, the British abandon their native allies, the balance of power shifts. It was up until the war of, eight, throughout the Revolutionary War and up until the War of 1812, the, the native people have the military power on this continent. After 1812, the balance of power shifts. And this sets up the, um, this paves the road for Indian removal. Some tribes were able to stay in the area. Why have the Pekagan Band of Potawatomi been able to remain in Michigan when so many of the other Potawatomi bands are in Kansas and Oklahoma? So here's a description from uh, one of the Pekagan um, Potawatomi members, uh, the director of its language and culture center. So leading into a treaty of Chicago, 1833, um, the American government was shipping in whiskey and trying to get the leaders drunk. So the next day they would just sign away. This was after uh, Indian Removal Act 1830. And so Pokagan said, don't go anywhere near that stuff. It's no good for our people. It's just going to bring us bad. So he abstained from that. And the second day of the treaty, he was able to negotiate because of our relationship with the locals. Uh, we're already farming and our good relationship with the Catholic Church. We could stay in the territory of Michigan, but we would be removed to the Arbor Croche or Harbor Springs area in 1838. Uh, 1838 comes around, that land's already occupied by Yellow Dawas and there's no place for us to go. So he purchased land, pooled monies together from the treaties purchased land in uh, Silver Creek Township, which is north of Dwajak. Actually, Pokagon Band did not have a say in what happened in Chicago. Um, that was more of the Prairie Band of Potawatomi. Well, there were many different Potawatomi bands. Our territory extended from Detroit all the way to this side of the state, down around Lake Michigan, up through um, the little harbor up in Wisconsin, down back down across Wisconsin and Illinois, and then down to the Tippecanoe River in Indiana. So our bands were spread out all over the so, place. So um, he mentioned the Prairie Band of Potawatomi, and my um, adopted grandfather, if you will, 
uh, a man who is very close to me, Nelson Chepo, um, is a parrot, was a Prairie Band Potawatomi member. And I, I interviewed him in 1986. Uh, and he, speaking in both Potawatomi and immediately translating himself in English, told me the story of Potawatomi removal as told to him by his uncle Numpke, who was one of the Potawatomi removed. And um, so I'm gonna play, this is a short excerpt and um, maybe some of you might, might be interested in hearing what Potawatomi sounds like. But when we came down here from Chicago, Skunk Town, Chicago, <laughs> That's when we went. You get the out oh up when that pear face come, that white man. Michigan. With with Steve Ingot, I see one here. Come be. And I give the Iag mean in the upshot. And school kicks I give the Iag when we went to the that's when we went to Michigan and come back and crossed the Mississippi, Minneva, Skokie, that Sagan Fox tribe, Tama. Like when we went to, they went to the Sagan Fox tribe, they stayed there for two, three weeks. Then they, then they told the part of I mean, that you should go down to uh, Omaha, among the Omahas. Go down there and it, they started out and they went. I don't know how long it took them. They, I forget what he said, two, three weeks. Got down there among the Omaha, that's where they met that Winnebago from Winnebago, Nebraska. He was a Winnebago who talk good part of me. But he had to show the ace to gay, he said to the chief, What are you doing here? You being a chief. Ah, give me one of Chicago up in here. That's Chicago. He said, Well, they chased us out of that skunk town. Chicago, he said. Yeah, what's your be I out He said, That's why we come here. You be the watch the and didn't do up diamond so now what what I uh, we're looking around for a place so we can call home. Huh it it I on you book uh gis yaman, he said. Yeah, go he said. We go to my people, Winnebago's. You be I go eva yeah, go eat moon. When we come over there, I'll tell you. You better watch shot take we shaman. We're going to go south for the a little hotter, but in uh, Scott Eggs here, that's Prairie. Come to the Prairie country, we're going to take you down there, and you can live there. Nobody around for 100 miles. Yeah, it was just sky on, or to make me in Chicago, in Chicago. That's what I'm doing today. So when they chase you out of Chicago, you come down here. So maybe uh, two, three weeks, maybe three weeks. Yeah, he, I guess Yayak. That's when we went. We got down to Kansas. Ah, my next and I see Mskodebzik. But there's a lot of buffalo. That's what they call that. See, Mskodebzik. That's a prairie cow. Yeah, he, I forget what they call antelope. Minigim swag. Tyx, not he, con. I'm no Eastniak. That's what. That's what we got all that wild game so we can eat very good. So what does Sam Howard for the story on so that could be? He got cocked out all nuggons. That's what he said. The great uh, the chief talking to the great spirit. Go to Sam Howard story on. What I ask so what they said. That's the way it was. They got down the cats. That's where they lived ever since. It was really interesting because at the time in 1986 I was working for a commercial ABC affiliate in Madison and covering um, some violent spearfishing uh, controversies on boat landings in northern Wisconsin and this interview I realized was really important and there were no none of the tribes back then it was before the um, National Indian Gaming Act and and uh, tribal casinos. So there was no money anywhere in any of the 12 um, tribes in Wisconsin and no um, archives or museums anywhere. Uh, and so I gave the, the, the video to the Wisconsin Historical Society 
and ask them to conserve it, and, which they did. And then, you know, here I am in 2017, um, coming to Northwestern. And one of the things that I had wanted to do was to create an indigenous tour of, of our campus. And uh, one of the stops is on the Treaty of Chicago. And I thought, oh, wow, this is, I remember that interview. And I called the Wisconsin Historical Society and asked if they would digitize the video and send it to me and let me use it in the tour, which they, which they did. Um, but the Pakagan Potawatomi and the Forest County Potawatomi, who really lack first speakers, um, for them, I, I asked if I could share it with those two bands uh, and the historical society said yes, but um, having that little piece of video and that story that's so important to the Potawatomi people as a, as a language resource is really wonderful. So um, I have a special spot in my heart for that little piece of video there. So um, Next week, we're going to take a closer look at the Native nations of the Upper Great Lakes region and really get into what my sweet spot is, and that um, is environmental justice, social justice, environmental threats, and climate change. So now I have to figure out how, how to get out of here. Oh, there it is. There's my... Um... Okay, I'm back. So... Um, that's all I have for you today. I figure, um, you know, speaking for an hour is long enough, uh, and I'm, but I'm happy to um, answer any questions if anybody has, um, has any questions for me. Patty. Yes, can you hear? Can you hear me, Patty? I can. Yeah. Uh, Roger, are you also unmuted? I, I am now, but... Yeah. You know, is, um, is, is Jason with us? Yes, uh, we had a problem with the chat log, but it's been fixed now. Oh, so okay. I'm going to be taking some questions uh, from chat and sharing them with, uh, with Patty. Um, so one of the first questions was um, whether the adoption and foster care uh, was voluntary or were the children taken? Uh, you, you dealt with that. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that? Yeah, and it's it's astonishing that this is just not something that is general knowledge. No, most of these, uh, most of the adoptions were not voluntary. Um, social workers came in, and um, and I I've heard these stories again and again and again, where social workers would come in and say, "You have nine children here, and um, and, and so we're going to take four of them," and you know, four were placed. There is a, um, you know, maybe next week I'll share an eight minute story that I did for PBS Wisconsin um, back about 10 years ago. The, the Menominee Nation had uh, an adoptee powwow and we were told that, they're, that and they were gonna do a ceremony, um, a wiping away the, of the tear ceremony. And we were told that there would be maybe 12 people or so that were going through the ceremony. So there was a, it's a big powwow and, and the Menominee were, were kind of standing in as a symbolic um, tribe to welcome back the adoptees and the foster, foster kids. And the Child Welfare League of America spokesman was there and he formally apologized. There were, I, I remember this woman holding up this little shoe and talking about how the social workers came in and grabbed kids and her mother, uh, one of the little girl's shoes fell off and the mother was you know, bereft and cried the rest of her life and never saw her kids again. And uh, it was really traumatic, but I don't, my understanding is that there were very few native people who consented to this. This was a coercive policy. The other thing that was going on between the 1950s and 1970s, which not a lot of people know about, is the forced sterilization of Native women. They would go into the Indian Health Service to deliver their children, and if they had, you know, one or two before, they the you know the women were put into kind of what they call a twilight sleep, 
And uh, when they woke up, their tubes had been tied. And oftentimes they weren't told about that. So there were a lot of, um, a lot of policies, uh, failed social experiments that were conducted on native people. I could talk about the, and I will talk about the uranium miners in Navajo country uh, next week. Then a, a question, actually a request from Nadia. I heard the narrator in the Vox documentary say that tribes organized to bring ICWA about. Right. If there are any resources or other information about those community organizing efforts and the political will generated, uh, could you name them? Yes, well, there's a national ICWA group. If you, if you Google ICWA.org, I think you'll, you know, you'll see um, national efforts. You also see state efforts. There's um, a really interesting documentary that was produced by a group in Wisconsin called um, Mending, Mending the Threads or thre something with threads in it. If you Google ICWA and threads and uh, video, it'll, it'll come up. Um, it's a short documentary, maybe 30 minutes, but it talks about um, not just the, the adoption issue, um, but how groups in various states are, are really insisting on policies. You know, you can have all the laws in the world, um, but if there's no teeth in them, if they're not, if judges aren't acting on them, then, you know, they're not, they're not effective. And so this group in Wisconsin got together representing all the tribes in that state, um, insisting on, on policies and consultation and setting up processes. And uh, it wound up as a bill that was introduced into the Wisconsin legislature. And I think it was unanimously passed. Um, a comment and then a question from Michelle. Uh, she, it looks like there's a, an exclamation mark after this. Zero federally recognized tribes in Illinois, which is not to say that there are no native people in the state. Right. Uh, that is the comment. The question is, why do many land acknowledgements refer to the Council of Three Fires instead of Anishinaabek? Anishina oh, yeah. Um, well, Anishinaabek. Uh, is the Potawatomi pronunciation of, uh, of the same group of people, Anishinaabe, um, which it, but it's all referring to the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe and Odawa who were in this area um, during the time of the two, there were two treaties of Chicago, but these were, if you look at the treaty of Chicago, it says a treaty between the Chippewa uh, Odawa and uh, Ottawa and Potawatomi, I believe, or maybe Potawatomi and, uh, and Ottawa. But um, that Council of Three Fires refers to the Anishinaabe or Anishinaabek Confederacy. Um, these are the, the confederated tribes that migrated together in this migration that happened probably a, millennial, uh, a millennium ago. If someone Googles Northwestern land acknowledgement, uh, is there a site where they can see that? Yes, um, you can go, if you go to the indigenous tour of Northwestern, and that is in the resource sheet that I um, shared with uh, Jeffrey who shared, I, I think he put that in the chat or in, in the email message, that indigenous tour of Northwestern is the very first stop is the land acknowledgement. But there's also, if you go to the Office of Inclusion and Diversity, um, OIDI, o -I -D -I, uh, on the Northwestern site, there is a page for land acknowledgements and it'll give you some context for land acknowledgements. The Council of Three Fires um, or the Anishinaabe Confederacy uh, was, was not the only group of native people here. Um, this was ancestral land to the Ho-Chunk people, to the Menominee people, to the Miami, and earlier than that, to groups like the Sauk and Fox and um, the Maskutin and the Kickapoo. Um, you know, this treaty, the, there, there wasn't the same concept of private property. And so groups moved through an area and used it. Sometimes, you know, they might clash. Oftentimes they would 
you know, they would not, they would just uh, interrelate. Um, as John Lau described earlier. Uh, and, and over time, there were different groups of native people in this area. So if the US negotiators would have, you know, showed up 20 years earlier, they might have been negotiating with the Sauk and Fox and not the Council of Three Fires. Thank you. Um, a question that I put in the chat, uh, could you talk about efforts to sustain or revive native languages in Illinois and Wisconsin? I've seen children's books in native languages in Canada. Um, is school time, may it be devoted to na native language instruction? Yeah, um, there, uh, there are a lot of revitalization efforts. Um, you know, here in, here in Illinois, we have a, some estimates have 129,000 native people in the state of Illinois, upwards of 89,000 native people in Chicago and the collar communities, um, representing you know more than well represent representing scores of, of tribes. I think the American Indian Center has got five members that represent 58 tribes. So this is um, this need to, to this feeling to learn language and preserve it because so much of culture is embedded in language and so many of our ceremonies are, you know, we're going to lose our ceremonies if we don't, you know, protect our, our languages because these ceremonies have to be conducted in our languages. Um, one of the things that's happening um, in, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put another, I'm going to put something in the chat here ways.org. Um, if you go to that site, there, uh, there's a really lovely short video, eight minutes, um, called Wadoka Dotting. You don't have to spell it. It's um, an, immers uh, an Ojibwe immersion school on the Lakota Ray Reservation in Wisconsin. They're, they're creating an immersion school on my reservation at Bad River. So kids learn you know, they, they are um, learning, the only sixth period is the only period where English is spoken and that's sixth period is foreign language. <laughs> so um, the Ho-Chunk um, are, have come up with a really interesting approach to save their language. They um, created an apprentice program and created four paid positions where the apprentices lived in close proximity to an elder who spoke nothing but Ho-Chunk um, Ho -Chunk language to them for two years. And at the end of that two year period, those four apprentices each became a speaker who was assigned four paid apprentices. So now they have been exponentially enlarging the pool of speakers and, um, and offering lang Ho-Chunk language classes in the public schools in a 12 county area in Wisconsin um, and paying for those programs so that a child in the, um, the Mauston School or Wisconsin Dells can take um, Spanish, French, German, or Ho-Chungra. <laughs> um, so, you know, the American Indian Center, I've taken Ojibwe language classes at the St. Kateri Center in, in Chicago. Um, their language classes, we offered Cherokee language classes at our center a couple of years ago. So we're trying and we're trying also to remember that two thirds of native people now live off their reservations, most of them in cities. And, you know, we're looking for language and culture resources as well. Thank you for that question. That's a, a really important question. A question from Mary Lewis. Who were the indigenous peoples who lived in early Southern Illinois, that is during the 1800s? Um, could have been the Kaskaskia, could have been the Peoria, um, could have been the Cahokia. Um, there were uh, at least 14 or 15 tribes here in Illinois. And those, you know, those people didn't disappear. Cahokia is a really interesting place. And I have to tell you, I, I um, uh, you all know that Cahokia is uh, an ancient settlement. It was the largest city in America until it was surpassed by Philadelphia in the 1800s, I think. 
but it's um, on the Illinois side, right across, you can see the St. Louis Arch from it. And this was a, a city of, of, of nearly 50,000 people in the, uh, it, it was uh, kind of at its, its golden period in probably in the 1100s to the 1500s. Um, and then it, uh, it was abandoned. Now, um, it, there, m one of my colleagues, Abigail Forstner uh, in Medill is writing a book about Cahokia. And she and I uh, traveled up to Wisconsin. I introduced her to the Ho-Chunk Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And he said, you know, you're thinking about, and she said, well, what happened to Cahokia? You know, was it an environmental disaster? Uh, was it warfare? And he said, you're thinking about Cahokia all wrong. Don't think of it as a city. Think of it, I mean, how would you describe the gold rush? You know, people came there because there it was flowering with, with trade, with spiritual ceremonies, with uh, people. It was just this amazing meeting place. And then when the glaciers um, arrived, people dispersed, and you know they 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 went to Cahokia because it was kind of the place to be. And he he looked at me and he said, "And your people were there, and the Menominee were there, and the you know the the." there were other tribes that gathered there. And then when the glaciers receded, they went back to where they were before, or they found new lands if there were people that were moving in. So, you know, the, the Cahokians, um, if you are interested, that, that's a really interesting piece of, of history. Um, and there's, there are documentaries about it that you can find online. Um, the Cahokia, um, Interpretive Center, it's a rest stop. Um, and um, if you ever get a chance to visit, it's really interesting. They've done a wonderful job with it. Thank you. Um, two questions from Natalie Gillespie. What was the population density like in the years leading up to the land grabs in this area? And well, why don't you, I let that- Yeah, I'm, yeah. I can't tell you that. I'm gonna have to, that's a good question. Um, that I will research and have an answer for you for next week. So come back and, and, and I'll tell you what the answer is. Here's another question from Natalie. Uh, how much did imported disease impact the populations here during that time? Yeah, smallpox was a, um, a major problem, tuberculosis. Um, I'm more familiar with, uh, with the period after that in the boarding schools. Um, I did a lot of research in the federal archives here in Chicago and found medical records of some of the regional government boarding schools. And um, the school superintendents were paid on a per pupil basis. So a lot of times they would round up kids and really overcrowd those schools. And kids were sleeping three to a bed and, um, and you know the mortality rate from tuberculosis from, um, from uh, influenza, there's trachoma, diphtheria, there are a lot of diseases that were passed around. Um, as far as the, the, the diseases leading up to some of the treaty making, um, I can't tell you specifically about the area of, of, uh, of Illinois. But one story I can tell you, which is a pretty interesting story. In 1763, um, well, back, backing up, um, the French and Indian War, which was a war, that's what we call it here, but there, it was another war in, in Europe, but it was fought here on this continent as well. When it was all over, and just as an aside, one of my relatives shows up on the cavalry rolls for um, General Montcalm fighting against Wolf on the Plains of Abraham. And that was a really decisive battle here. But at the end of it, the, the French had to turn over their 14 forts to the British. And those forts um, were all along the Mississippi River, um, uh, St. Louis, Prairie du Chien, uh, Michilimackinac. Uh, there's a fort at Green Bay, Fort Detroit, Fort Pitt. So they had to um, turn their forts over to the, the British. And 
The native people by and large did not like the British much. They much preferred the French who um, were uh, much more lax with credit. They, they didn't have the racial attitudes that the British sometimes did. They were intermarrying um, with uh, native women and uh, life was just better with the French as far as the native <laughs> people are concerned. And so um, they turned over the forts to the British and Pontiac, who was a, um, a Shawnee um, Delaware, pri primarily Delaware Indian, organized this, um, this uprising. And the plan was that uh, in June, on a particular day in June in 1763, the, all the native people around each fort were going to rise up and attack the fort in their area so that the British couldn't send you know, reinforcements from one fort to another. So all 14 forts were attacked on the same day. And at Fort Michilimackinac, where my, my ancestors and the Sauk were tasked with, um, with subduing that fort, um, we devised a ruse in which we, we told the garrison that we were gonna play lacrosse for the benefit of the troops in honor of the king's birthday. So the warriors were playing, you know, the 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 lacrosse players were actual were actually warriors and the people that were watching that had blankets around them had, you know, weapons hidden. And the plan was that the ball would, you know, errantly go over the picketing of the fort three times. Um, and then the third time that would be the signal for them to attack the court, the the fort. So they're playing the game, whoops, the ball goes over the picketing, a soldier throws it back, game continues, whoops, the ball goes over the picketing a second time, soldier throws it back. Third time, the ball goes over the picketing, someone op actually opened up the doors to the fort, the Ojibwe attacked, it was over, and the sock, it was over in 12 minutes. We have um, a diary that was uh, kept by one of the British soldiers in the fort who hid under the, in a, a second floor apartment under Mary Langlade's dirty laundry. Langlade, Wisconsin has a county named for Charles Langlade, who was a, a mixed blood um, active during this time. So um, 12 of the forts fell, Fort Pitt and Fort Detroit. Uh, the, the native folks in those areas held them under siege for months. And Jeffrey Amherst, who was the Indian agent for the Brit British at the time, sent out, uh, he, he told um, Pontiac that, uh, that he wanted to you know, develop a friendship and talk about what had happened and make amends. And so um, he sent smallpox infected blankets to Pontiac. And it sickened is the first episode of biological warfare conducted on this continent. Um, it sickened many of the people in Pontiac's war party, most of them died. And that was pretty much the end of the siege. The, the, the French gave the forts back to the British and, um, and we know about Amherst's uh, decision to um, infect the blankets with smallpox because he left a letter that described what he was planning to do. Next question from Jason. With the pro sports teams fading away from terminology and images, what is your opinion of the future of the Blackhawks name and logo? Boy, uh, you know, I'm ready to have them change their their name and logo. You know, um, I there is one small group in Seminole that makes the big foam fingers for um, the Florida State University teams, um, and they, you know, they support the the mascot there. But almost every Native organization that has a right to speak for Native people from the American Indian College Fund and Native American Journalists Association and um, 
the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, uh, multiple hundreds of tribes have all passed resolutions saying we don't want to be mascots. And, you know, I'm often asked this when I speak to mostly service clubs, rot Rotarians and Lions clubs, I inevitably I'll get somebody saying, and it'll always start with, um, I went to a school um, that had Indians, uh, we were the Indians and we were really proud and, and we, you know, we really felt like we were honoring, how do you feel? And, and what I tell them is, you know, it's kind of like a, 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 a favorite relative, your a, a favorite aunt gives you a gift and you open it up and it's a lime green leisure suit with little fuzzy bunnies on it. And she insists that you put it on and you, you put it on to please her and you look in the mirror and you're just absolutely mortified. And she, but she's insistent, you know, I made this for you. I'm honoring you. You know, when everything is said and done, who has the right to decide whether they feel honored by an Indian mascot? Native people or the people that, you know, are insisting that we wear these labels. No, we don't want to be mascots. We don't want to be objects. And the Washington professional football team, um, and I don't know if, if people know the origin of Redskins, but this came out of the gold rush when there were bounties on Native Americans. It was a dollar for a native man. It was 50 cents for a native woman. It was 25 cents for a native child. And it was too cumbersome to bring the entire bodies in. So the bounty hunters cut off the genitals of native people that they were hunting uh, in order to be paid. And this they were called redskins. So, you know, this is just such a horrendous term and finally, the Washington professional football team dropped it. And I'm so grateful that they did. Um, but there are plenty of other collegiate teams and teams like the Blackhawks that, you know, insist that they're honoring us by using these names. And I, I beg to differ. Um, I just want to remind everyone that uh, questions that we do not get to this evening uh, we'll go into the chat log and Professor Lowe will have an opportunity to comment uh, on them or answer questions. Uh, so please don't feel left out if I'm skipping a couple of questions now that I think might be better answered in, in writing anyway. Here's uh, something from Sarah Romer Feeberg. Uh, I met some people in Spirit Lake, North Dakota who were in Indian schools. Uh, I wonder if there were Indian schools around longer than the 1940s? Yes. Um, <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> um, a woman taught me about the correct sage to use for various medical conditions. Is herbal medicine still practiced? Yes, absolutely. Um, although I think um, most of the healers that I know will never discourage someone from using Western medicine as well. But for example, I've, I've uh, witnessed um, healings where uh, somebody with diabetes was being healed and um, the, the medicine person knew, um, was asking her about the dosages and was very familiar with all the Western medication she was taking. And, and, but he prescribed um, uh, a, a bare root tea for her. And she said, should I stop taking my insulin? He said, no, 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 don't take your insulin. What's, don't stop taking your insulin. Um, but what I think you're going to find is that um, the amount of your insulin is going to diminish if you, if you take this tea regularly. And you might even be able to get off injection, might be able to just you know, take, take um, your medicine uh, orally in a pill form. I saw that woman about a year after she, this, this healing um, event that, that we were both at. And, um, and I asked her how she was doing and she was completely off insulin. So these, you know, these, um, we still use, uh, uh, um, and I'm gonna forget the, the English names, Co um, Kobash, Kobash. Um, for, 
female problems and echinacea. We use that for my my grandfather used um, mullen, uh, which um, my our food sovereignty group at uh, Bad River is growing mullen, which is a tall uh, yellow weed that's used for um, congestion. And uh, there, we're, we still use a lot of our traditional medicines, but um, we're also using Western science too. Um, the number one drug for, um, for lung, breast, and colon cancer, which I'm gonna, Taxol, um, comes from the Pacific yew tree and it was synthesized by Bristol Myers Squibbs. Um, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, I don't know, 20 years ago. Of course, the Salish women that shared that medicine with the Western world didn't get a penny from it. And Taxol has made Bristol Myers billions of dollars in profits. But yes, short answer is we're still using our medicines. We have time for one or two more questions. Uh, here's one from Rob and Joan Linsenmeyer. Did these tribes all speak Algonquin languages? Could most people understand the language of other tribes? You know, as recently as the 1980s, um, the Ojibwe could still understand the Menominee, um, even though, you know, to look at the language, it looks completely different, but um, apparently, um, it sounds similar. Um, the, you know, in the in the upper Great Lakes region, the the Sioux in Minnesota have a totally different dialect, but it's related to the Ho Chunk language, is a Sioux in, a Sioux in language at its root. The Algonquin tribes, um, most of the the um, tribes like the Kaskaskia, the Peoria. Um, those tribes had, I, I, I believe, Algonquin languages. And, you know, because of all these migrations, um, the, the root language is the same, but the dialects are quite different. I'm not an, a, a fluent Ojibwe speaker. I have some vocabulary. Um, and I'm, I see similarities in words, for example, in Menominee or Miami or Ojibwe, the word for, uh, in, in Potawatomi, the word for bear is all makwa or something similar to M-A-K-W-A. It might be spelled a little bit differently, but, um, but that word is still the same. So we, we have words um, that, are, that have remained the same, but I think there's been enough time with migrations that uh, it's really difficult for people of one tribe, even if they speak an Algonquin language to understand people from another tribe. Um, but that's not my area of expertise. <laughs> I'm kind of wading in and I'm not sure that I have the expertise to answer that. Um, I, that's my best guess. We will have to bring in a professor of pharmaceutical science. <laughs> um, and linguistics. <laughs> Last, a uh, question is uh, from our uh, video president, Roger Boy. Uh, would you favor Northwestern not only offering courses in one or more native languages, but also allowing those courses to count for the Weinberg foreign language graduation requirement? Wow, absolutely, <laughs> Roger. That's, that, I would love that. You know, I, I would like to see us really focus on um, not just the tribes of the Upper Great Lakes region, but the Cheyenne Arapaho. I mean, this, these were the communities that were devastated um, by the actions of our founder. And so I, I truly think that we have a debt that has not yet been paid to the Cheyenne Arapaho. I'd like to see us, um, you know, I think it'd be wonderful to help uh, with a language revitalization program whether those classes are held here in Chicago or back in Montana and, and Oklahoma where they are now, um, I, I think that's up to them, but um, this would be a wonderful service to Native America to help revitalize and protect these languages. I think we can adjourn for this evening and reconvene in a week. I wanna close with uh, a comment from uh, Peter Sternberg 
uh, which I think speaks for all of us. This is so important for us to know and explore. The white people of this country have much to reckon with and take responsibility for. Thank you very much. Everyone, see you next week. And uh, remember, uh, we'll be sending out the chat log with comments and responses to most of these questions that we haven't gotten to today. And thank you everyone so much for coming and thanks especially to uh, Professor Patty Lowe for all of her insights and information. Good night.